I'm, I've got, what, five minutes, so this is going to be pretty quick. I'm only going to talk about one of the data capture projects that we've got running at Melbourne because at the moment we've only got one data capture project running at Melbourne, so I thought the best, we've got a whole lot of others that are about to start, but I thought the best thing to do is actually talk about the one that we've been running for all of this year and really just focus on some of the things that we've learnt from that project. The project was uh, entitled, this is the, the, uh, the title we gave to Anne's, it was Enhanced Metadata Capture for Sustainable Management, Sharing and Reuse of APN Histopathology Research Data. Now what does that all mean? APN stands for the Australian Phenomics Network. Um, I'll get to this, uh, my only slide for the day, uh, I'll get to this uh, shortly and it sort of explains the intricacies in which we're working. But the major thing I really want to do is just to, to get to that uh, what it is that we've, the way we've gone about the project and the sort of things that we've learnt through that process and how we're going to be using those learnings in thinking about the data capture projects that we're going to be rolling out over the next 18 months or so, 12 to 18 months. Uh, just to mention that um, uh, a major partner in this uh, project for us has been Versi, who are, uh, and it's, uh, it's been important to have that uh, Another, another view and another form of expertise, another set of skills to be able to bring in into a project like this. Just keep an eye on the time. In 2007, Oliver Smithies, who was at the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of North Carolina, won a Nobel Prize. That's um, his Nobel lecture turning pages, and I recommend that you go to Google and ha look this up, um, <clears throat> was a culmination of um, his, his lecture and his Nobel Prize was a culmination of 60 years in the lab and 130 dense and comprehensive laboratory notebooks which he kept religiously. In his, uh, in turning the pages, he actually, uh, his overheads for his talk were all images of his laboratory notebooks which were dense with data. Probably the lesson from that is that he is probably the only person in the world could actually understand that data, but it is actually an incredibly valuable archival source for him, but also for the people that came to, to uh, do the work that, um, uh, that led to him getting a Nobel Prize. His, part of his work over that 60 years was on gene targeting and technologies that enable you to do specific things with specific genes, and uh, a lot of that was basically working in, in uh, animals and other cellular things. Uh, when that was combined in around about 1985 with um, the emerging uh, embryonic stem cell um, capability that, that also turned up, which was done independently, uh, which basically means that you, they could um, um, grow mice, as, for, as an example, from, singular, from single cells. Uh, basically, when you brought gene targeting and embryonic stem cells together, it meant you could make animal models of human genetic diseases. So that was about 1985. So it's quite a long time ago. The, uh, that work was published in 1987, and by 1988, um, through collaborations with others, they actually had a general approach for producing mice of any desired genotype. Now, this was... Um, you know, a, a fundamental breakthrough, and by 1991, there was the first mouse model of cystic fibrosis. Now, basically, what this means is that you can reliably take, a, you know, a specific form of mouse. You can uh, alter it. You can produce a mouse with a, a, a disease that mimics a, a human disease, and then you can run tests, you know, drugs and other things against that uh, mouse to see what sort of effect it has. Now that's a whole area of medical research that's blossomed over the last 20 years and at the University of Melbourne uh, and, and essentially that um, that research area is captured in the Australian Phenomics Network, this community that starts to bring this sort of data together. At the University of Melbourne we have a service that is part of that phenomics um, and mouse modelling network which is the uh, histopathology group. Basically what they do is uh, a researcher will come to them and say, okay, uh, from the people who provide the mice with particular genetic problems, they say, okay, um, we've got this mouse, we've run these tests, uh, we now need to have the, the, the mice killed, cut up and analysed for their pathology. So this is what the histopathology service does at Melbourne. And this is a service that has evolved probably over the last sort of 10, 5 to 10 years. It's, it had evolved in a way that um, was a sort of a bit manual. It was sort of trying to figure out exactly how the workflow processes were going to work. So there were bits of manual handling, uh, there were bits of 
technology that were used, but it was all fairly clunky. And within the framework uh, that had emerged nationally, which is POD, the Phenomics Ontology Database project, which is a, uh, a Menenkris funded, uh, or NEAT funded um, activity, um, they were looking at how what was happening in hops at the University of Melbourne in that pathology service could lead to the data about these mice flowing into the national framework in, in a much more systematic way. And so the project, the data capture project, was a, I mean, it's a really good model because we had an established workflow. We had data that was being collected that included you know, digital data plus also slides and samples and, also, and other things, the, the, the one minute. Um, so we had to look at how, how we could bring productivity gains into that, that point. Um, and what we've had is a, a modeler and some technology building. I suppose the key learning was that the, there are many variables in the model and the most important work we've been doing is actually modeling the true work environment and all the variables that are involved so that we can deal, whatever we build, we'll actually be able to deal with all of the variables that we have seen from the past but we can anticipate will be in the future so that the model we build about the data flow does not constrain or constrict unnaturally the work that has to be done. For example, sort of things that occur in double blind trials. So anyway, we've made a lot of progress and but that's all I want to say. I've been different. You're doing. Yeah. I'm directing the data capture projects at Monash University. Um, with the funding that we've been kindly given by ANS, we've actually got eight sub projects and what I'm hoping to do in this session is give you a background in our methodologies that we have adopted at Monash and also like a whirlwind tour of each of the eight sub projects so it's going to be pretty quick. So talking about methodologies and that, the things that are important to us at Monash is that first of all the solution has got to be researcher driven. Also uh, agile software development methodologies, we're finding that the old waterfall technique just doesn't work. This idea of analysing at the front, having a good idea of what they want and then sort of building it and then delivering it at the end. You really have to build it as you go. Researchers work in a very uh, different way from um, standard businesses and that. Uh, also working in the research disciplines community. So if they've already got something in their environment and some of the products I'm talking about uh, later on, that's part of their environment. We have to work in with that. We can't go and build a separate solution that's very different. It's got to fit in with the, the current and emerging sort of environment. Also collaboration with other institutions, getting the ideas out that we've actually got here at Monash. Um, we've already started to do that with um, people in Versi and in the Synchrotron, and we'll talk about that in a bit in a minute. Um, down the bottom, it's already sort of starting to come up, but the basic sort of fundamentals in each of our sub-projects is, um, first of all, um, as I said, working in with the environment, select uh, the appropriate data management solution, whatever that might be. Um, one of the solutions that we've got, we're working with a product called Amiro as a data management solution. Um, with the funding that we've got, we really can't build a separate data management solution for each particular project. Um, building the appropriate infrastructure and integrating that in with the data management solution. Also building the reuse infrastructure and also adding that in. And then finally linking it up to ANS. So it's very fundamental to each of the sub-projects I'll talk about now. Climate and weather, it's sort of looking at um, modelling um, uh, rain or actually simulating rainfall in the urban area. And why this group wants to do it at the moment is their, their particular output is that they actually want to help with the design and adoption of stormwater harvesting, as you can sort of see in the, the far diagram. That's one example of stormwater harvesting. So they've got all of these huge simulations. Some of them are taking quite some time to do. And they want to put that data out and make it available to other researchers. So that's sort of coming out of our climate and weather. Down the bottom, you can sort of see what the emerging sort of solution, NetCDF, is sort of coming out as a very important aspect. As I said, walking, working in with the researchers and what's important to them. And uh, Simon Yu, who's in the audience, and I sort of invite you to talk to him later on about this if you're interested, he's basically started to develop a solution along with our senior business analyst, Nigel uh, uh, Holgate, in that particular area. But we can talk about that more later. Ecosystems measurements. What this is about is that. Um, Around Australia, we've got a number of these towers that are basically being built or established. They collect um, measurements in waterfall as well as carbon. And the idea is to sort of monitor that uh, over time. Now, these have been going for quite some time. They're part of the Ausflux network, um, which is part of a broader flux network uh, around the world. Um, with 
funding that's come out of TURN, which is an NGRIS funded um, initiative, uh, the Ausflux project is actually pushed forward. Um, but they're sort of ma missing that data management solution. What we're actually helping them do is helping them with the capture side uh, lead into a data management solution, which in their case is a number of different databases, and then making that available to others uh, around the world through ANS and through other initiatives. Molecular biology. Um, this is probably um, a lot of these projects. Uh, some of them are actually quite progressed now, and this one um, is a uh, is one that's sort of doing quite well. And um, we're hoping the others will also do as well as this one. Um, what it is, it's an initiative where we've basically gone and worked with Versi and uh, people at the Australian Synchrotron and continuing to, to do work in that particular space. But what's happening there is, uh, in the past, our researchers would actually run an experiment at the Synchrotron, they'd get their large hard drive, they'd go to the Synchrotron, they'd then sort of come back to Monash, whichever are in the institution, and then access their data there. Um, the problem is that they'd actually find that with these hard drives and that, they'd keep using them over and over again, so their reliability would lose out. And, you know, if you've gone and grown this crystal, which could take a, quite a bit of time in itself, and then you basically, um, um, do the experiment, which doesn't take long now on the synchrotron, um, it'd be quite a major setback to lose that data. So with this solution, which was basically turned on very early this year and is now sort of spreading its wings to other institutions, uh, we know that La Trobe has got an instance of it, and I think the University of Melbourne is either establishing it or was almost there. Um, once again, what we're trying to do is make it easy for the data capture side, um, making it easy for the management side, um, we're using, we're building on what the work we've done in MyTardis, which is a relatively generic solution. At the moment, it's been applied to micro, micro, molecular biology, but it actually can be spread to other different areas, as we're sort of finding with other groups, such as RMIT. Um, multimedia collections and Arrow. So what this is, this is about is sort of saying, we've got this large um, repository at Monash, the Arrow re digital repository, and it's quite capable of actually storing uh, and um, providing this research data. And um, we're sort of providing another means of actually um, making this research data available to it. We sort of started this about two or three years ago um, with micro molecular biology when we're sort of looking at protein crystallography, trying to make their data available through Arrow. But what this is saying is there's a lot of simple data out there that we can really just clean up on uh, and make a very generic way of putting it in. The photos you're seeing are actually from Kashgar. Uh, a photographer, John Gollings, wants to make his collection available. It's quite a valuable set. Uh, of, of research data. Uh, so that's really adding quite a lot there. And we can, as far as we're concerned, it's got a lot of more generic uses than just the cash guard collection. History of adoption, um, what it's about is um, we've got this researcher at Monash University, Marion Quarterly, and she wants to collect all these stories about people, uh, how they were sort of adopted, uh, and, and make them available. Um, but in the past, the way they would have collected these stories was that actually get people to, um, that actually hire some people, that go out and actually collect these stories from people in the community, wouldn't necessarily be a, a, a large or, or diverse sort of sample, and then they'd sort of provide those particular stories. Now through the internet, they can actually capture more of those stories. So what we're using is technologies such as Confluence to help them capture those stories. And Confluence is good because it's done through the Faculty of Arts. They've got a lot of experience there with Confluence now, and they can actually do a lot of the moulding of the product that we actually give them. So we're sort of providing them really with the underlying infrastructure and letting them mould and style the solution they actually uh, use. So we're capturing those stories from the community. We're, 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 making, we're actually storing them in MediaFlux at the moment because MediaFlux gives us the ability of appropriate uh, connections with metadata. And then we're sort of making it available once again to the community and to researchers through Confluence. And then the intention is to actually um, finally connect up to Anne's. Um, two minutes? Yeah, thanks. Uh, interferome, um, what this is about is uh, uh, a researcher in oncology uh, who's quite well known, Professor Paul Herzog. Um, he's actually trying to collect all of these interferons. Interferons are proteins that actually help with um, generating genes that are important for the immune system. And so what he's got is he's got this interferome database and, and he's looking for us to give him help to actually capture more information from the community. Um, at the moment, they're entering a lot of data themselves. I think they've got uh, arenas here. Is it 40 that they've got at the moment? Is that right? Something like that. But they'd like the community to contribute a lot more. And so Paul's basically making these connections in with other researchers, and he's telling them about it. The solution down the bottom right-hand corner is sort of showing these extra um, uh, areas where we're sort of hoping to get um, extra bits of this data um, put into our warehouse. The warehouse, the data warehouse is called BASE. 
but interferon sort of looking more at the interferon collection. And as you can probably see, there's others. We've got to work in with the environment. As Gavin had, you can see GO, the, um, uh, another system that's very common in this particular space. So interferon's getting established there um, and also hooking it up with ANS. That's what this project's pretty much about and making that, those particular bits of um, information available to the broader community. Um, microscopy um, collects a whole lot of these TIFF images and that. And you can sort of see a sample of them in, in your top left-hand corner. And what they're finding is that it's very difficult to manage the, the research data. All of their, their students and that are basically collecting a whole lot of different uh, images and it's very hard for them to find stuff. The other thing is that they can't actually search across the whole collection. And what they'd really like is to have this holistic sort of collection with the appropriate bits of metadata. And if they see a particular abnormality in, say, a cell, they can sort of find out where else it's happened, data mine it, and find out where else it's happened, and then sort of lead back one minute or less. Uh, and um, so, once again, a very sort of exciting sort of project. Working in with the Amiro system that's coming out of OME, the Open Microscopy Environment, and you can sort of see an example of that down in the corner. So, modification of that to suit the, the how, what we want to do here. Working in um, with um, capturing, some of the capture stuff is having, happening automatically. So Lavisha Garrick, in the, who's actually in the second row, is actually doing some interesting work there out of David Abramson's group to try and automate that and make it very easy to collect lots of data for the researcher. Um, the final project, each of the other ones are sort of looking at very discipline specific projects, but we wanted something that would sort of focus on the long tail of researchers and could be moved from one in environment to uh, one institution to another. And so this is sort of our, like, um, that project that's really targeting, you know, it's, it's sort of building this uh, environment that we can easily share with other institutions. And our code name for it at the moment, and it may change over time, is I share my research. Uh, and what it's sort of looking at is taking the work we've done in my TARDIS and actually tailoring it and making it available to other research institutions. So if they don't have a discipline specific uh, solution at the moment, they can actually apply this. And finally, um, the team, most of them are here today, uh, except for Ray, who's unfortunately sick. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. My name is Oli, I'm from Versi, from the Victorian eResearch Strategic Initiative. And I would like to talk about um, the metadata capturing project we, we are doing at the Australian Synchrotron and then later at ANSTO. So uh, this project, the MECAT project, is a joint venture between the Australian Synchrotron and um, ANSTO in Sydney. Okay, so the MECAT project is a joint venture between the Australian Synchrotron and ANSTO. Um, it's aimed to improve the metadata management of all the experimental data captured at the uh, Synchrotron and ANSTO. Um, the Synchrotron, yeah, it's in Clayton, is a, is a light source providing X-rays in a various range of um, wavelengths, having different experiments sitting there at the moment, nine beam lines, producing two terabytes of raw data a year. Um, and at ANSTO, there's seven um, experiments using uh, neutrons. Um, so we want to provide services to researchers to manage better their experimental data um, and give an opportunity for data search and raw data access to a broader community. We are focusing on developing an extensible searchable web-based catalog for these data um, in an ARCS compatible data repository and also facilitate the harvesting um, by the Australian Research Data Commons of me, uh, public metadata. The aim is to increase the visibility and the value of these uh, experimental data um, by uh, improving scientists' own data and metadata management, and providing a more efficient use of the beam time by reroutes of already existing research data, and also enable other research groups to validate already published results by um, reproducing their experiments. So we have a, a few challenges to face here, mostly technical, a little bit of human engineering as well. Um, so first of all, we need to design an, an, a standardized and automated workflow within the research of the scientists. So the metadata is captured as the data comes out of the beam lines. We need to interface this to the control systems. Um, once the data is captured and stored, we have several access controls. We have to have several access controls in place so to make sure that the data is not public before the publication is out. And, and also to, to meet the requirement of the facility that data is um, pub 
public at least after three years. No, no after three years um, has been collected. Um, we have to have data management um, tools in place um, for versioning of the data sets um, and derived data sets to handle annotations. And uh, we need to create um, persistent data handles so in case the data is moved to a different storage or just to a different location, um, the handles are point to the to the new uh, location. And uh, we need to provide um, download facilities to the to the raw data, which is linked to the metadata. Um, all this um, needs to inter needs to be interfaced with the already existing infrastructure of the facility. So there is a proposal and, and booking database, for example, and a local storage, which we uh, need to interface. Um, and as base technology um, for the metadata catalog, um, TARDIS has been chosen. TARDIS is a federated diffraction image repos publication repository developed at Monash by um, Steve Andrew, Andrew Larkis <laughs> et al. And it's archiving and sharing uh, X-ray diffraction images at the moment from the protein crystallography community um, here within Australia. And we plan to um, adapt this to all other um, experiments conducted at the Australian Synchrotron. It uses uh, uh, the core scientific metadata soft schema to the describe uh, experiments, and is already deployed as the protein crystallography beamline at the Synchrotron. And as the data is created at, at the Synch, um, the metadata is, is collected within the facility. And um, Anthony just uh, mentioned this. Um, it's a, it allows the researchers to shift, to sift through their files and associated metadata and download then parts or the entire experiment to their institution or uh, personal hard drive. And it's um, already interfaced to the proposal and booking database of the facility, so um, it, it, it collects all the information from the different databases and the raw data and the metadata and puts them together and provides them to the the product community. Um, TARDIS itself is based on Django, which is um, an open source web application framework in, in Python, um, which aims to ease the creation of complex database driven websites. Yeah, that's already it. We Thanks, Margaret. Um, I just should mention that unfortunately physics couldn't uh, make it today, so I'm filling in. I, uh, the e-research office is um, managing the projects, but we don't uh, actually do them, so I'm going to have to be very uh, careful about what I say, because um, I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, never mind. Um, the uh, Centre for Materials and Surface Science at La Trobe, um, you know, is a major uh, laboratory um, hosting a lot of um, um, equipment. Uh, the the equipment there, I mean, we have very similar issues with 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 the synchrotron. In that the equipment produces a hell of a lot of data, um, and it has to be managed. And uh, there's a lot of people involved in in using that equipment. Um, uh, lots of universities and other organisations. So the problems are similar in that we have data management, data access um, issues, there are legal issues um, and, the, and, and the data have to be curated so that um, um, it can be usable by other people which is what ANS is here for. So it's a, a lovely overlap with um, the requirements of ANS. Uh, the, pro the biggest problem is that they've found is in dealing with the data from the moment of creation to uh, some endpoint, which up till now is typically a CD or a DVD or something like that. And that pipeline has a whole series of steps to it, which is not just analysis, but adding of metadata, trying to understand the proprietary format, which is a major issue in, in, in this laboratory um, with the equipment that it's got. Um, and, and separating out all those elements. But even understanding what uh, defines the, what, what's, what is typically called the golden master of the data that has to be um, kept as the original in the repository from which all other um, data can be derived. Um, the other problem is because of these proprietary formats, 
the, the international field is actually kept back from collaborating properly and that's been a major issue at the various conferences and so on that uh, people of, of like mind go to. H how do we uh, uh, deal with the, with the outputs and allow the companies that produce these instruments to feel secure um, with their IP and their, their profits and all the rest of it that they can give up some um, element of their, of their data formats to allow proper collaboration to continue. So uh, that's a very critical point um, for, for the lab and they see themselves, and I'm talking about the lab at La Trobe, they see themselves very much as leading in this area, especially um, with this um, project. So the ANS project has come along at a, at a perfect time to provide the framework for a lot of this uh, to occur. So we've talked about my TARDIS with, at, at, at the synchrotron, which is not, um, um, not the only possibility, I'd have to say, for dealing with this data. Really, obviously, any database that can handle metadata and so on is, is theoretically suitable. So um, we have to be very careful about um, what is something that has long-term uh, value and, 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 and um, uh, accessibility and, and use and, and, and so on. Um, but, you know, obviously this space is, is a growing and changing field. So, you know, we have to uh, watch that very carefully. But we're going to have to make decisions now. So, you know, I guess a guess, a, a guess is as good as anything in some of this sort of stuff. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, many of the uh, people who use the, the facilities at La Trobe um, have IP and commercial and confidence issues. Um, they're using it as a commercial facility. So whatever uh, is produced is almost certainly not a single instance repository which is just available to everybody. It will have to be restricted and, and in fact to, to make people um, um, happy with the way the data is um, stored. It will almost certainly have to be a multi-instance database to uh, make sure that people are happy with the fact that their data is not going to be viewed by somebody else, that they, their competitors and, and so on. But a, a major part of the data is to, meant to be out there, publicly accessible, um, and particularly the, the metadata components of that. There's a, another aspect of the public data in that the whole field of surface science um, has this issue of being able to compare what are called standard spectra so that um, if we have the surface of a particular material um, that there is a, a, a world standard for the spectra for that surface, there is somewhere you can go for that and uh, use it in your analysis and, and perhaps enable you to understand what the surface of your material is based on those worldwide standards. Those standards will only be produced um, through uh, uh, common goals, through working together, collaborating with, with other people. Um, so this, the, the standards are obviously a, you know, a difficult component, um, but the harvesting of the data from the machines uh, to get to, to all that, to that point is uh, what we're dealing with at the moment. Versi is helping us a lot. Thank you very much um, for that. We've still got a long way to go though. Um, uh, I think the end, end result though is that uh, apart from having these databases that can be accessed, which is interesting of, of itself, but being able then to have the analytical tools online as well so that people can get in and do what they need to do um, in a standardised way will also be interesting. So I think a repository is actually only one step in that direction. We really need to think about how the analytical tools can be used as well. Um, that's really about it. Oh, good morning. Um, I don't have any overheads, uh, probably because even though I work for the e-research office one day a week, the other six days a week I operate as a harassed university professor. So. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully what are the information I give you will be useful and informative. Um, RMIT is in the final stages of approval of a data capture project which is called uh, Data Capture from High Performance Computing uh, from Multi-User Environments. 
Uh, its collaborators at this stage will be uh, the NCI National Facility, VPAC, and possibly uh, Monash University through my TARDIS. The basic motivation uh, for the project was that um, RMIT has a very strong uh, or, or number of very strong groups that research in computational condensed matter physics and computational material science um, and their work basically is in uh, simulation and property pre uh, prediction of materials. Uh, they have a significant publication record and uh, they have a very strong ARC grant track record and of course because of that um, the data that they generate uh, comes under the Australian Code of Responsible Contact uh, Conduct for Research. The, that document was produced in 2007 uh, and that document talks about um, a cura university responsibilities for curation of data. So this ANS project came around uh, at a very timely, in a very timely fashion. So basically um, because um, RMIT has a very strong uh, usage of HPC facilities both at the NCI National Facility and at VPAC. Uh, what we've done is we've identified uh, a number of uh, software programs that these researchers used. We've identified four, possibly five. But these programs which are used uh, to do you know, computational simulation of matter uh, are also used by a number of other institutions around Australia. Um, I think three of the four programs that we've, uh, software programs we've identified are used by seven other institutions around Australia uh, and a number of research groups within those institutions. So um, although it's important to RMIT researchers to develop some software tools to um, curate uh, uh, data that is generated on these HPC facilities, I think that the software tools that we develop will be of uh, interest and of use to a number of other institutions around Australia. Um, the, other, the, the other institutions that we've identified that use these programs are you know, University of Sydney, University of Melbourne, University of Queensland, CSIRO, Monash, ANU, Newcastle, Curtin University and UTS. Now the purpose of these software tools will basically be to uh, interface to these uh, four or five common software uh, programs which are used for simulation of matter. Uh, they'll interrogate the output uh, that is generated by these programs to be able to extract relevant metadata. Uh, so we'll have a metadata wrapping and then the, the metadata that's formed and the data itself will be stored in an appropriate format uh, for long-term storage. We expect that these software tools will be um, developed from um, open source software that's uh, available, maybe with some shell scripting around it or something like that. Uh, the software tools will be freely available once they're developed to all RMI, well, to all researchers, uh, and they'll be they'll be uh, stored in some kind of open source um, repository like SourceForge or, or Google Code or something like that. Um, we have also committed to um, just as, uh, as an institution uh, store a number of um, data collections using these software tools on. Um, you know, uh, software, uh, software and data repositories, uh, common software and data repositories. Um, one of the other things we'll probably do with um, the code that we develop is we'll um, code in there some kind of tri time trigger function if it's stored in um, some national data repository so that after a certain period of time the data would be open to a wider community. Uh, we still have to negotiate exactly how we do that. but. The basic idea is to, as I say, uh, develop uh, software tools which will interface with common um, uh, software that's available on these um, state and, and national uh, supercomputer facility um, centres and uh, to develop these tools so that they'll interface with output data, uh, create metadata and, and store everything in an appropriate format for storage. So that's the project we hope to uh, embark on uh, shortly.